In 1943, my parents were imprisoned. It was heart-wrenching. Many people lose everything. The voices of Asian people were coming out. Young people fighting to make change happen. They had to assert their rights. If a lot of people put their mind to it, they can win. These are stories about what it meant to be resilient. I grew up with the American dream. This is our story. I'll be the moderator for today's panel discussion. Let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Shafiq Rahman. I was born in Bangladesh. I left for Germany 47 years ago for my undergraduate education and came to this country five years after that for a PhD. And I've lived here ever since. I've worked in the physics department at Allegheny College for 32 years. Currently, I'm writing a romantic novel based on memoirs from my undergraduate years about love shattered by the Cold War. I'm very thankful for a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation for this work. <laughs> More than 20 million Asian Americans currently reside in the US. That's about 6% of the population. It represents the fastest growing racial group in the country. So this documentary is very timely. The history of immigration from Asia, as the documentary showed, consists of opportunities, hard work, success, and uplifting stories, but also of injustice and disappointments. Despite setbacks from time to time, the immigrant community enjoys broad rights in this country today. We will cover issues related to stories shown in the screening, but in today's context. <clears throat> Later in the discussion, we will take a critical look at the role of Asian American community in relation to, to the current unrest that's sweeping through this country. Toward the end, we will entertain questions. We have seven panelists today. It's a diverse group representing a broad spectrum of the local community. Academicians and business people, performing artists and engineer, city official and working for a non-profit. Six are immigrants and one represents the second generation. At the beginning, I'll direct each question to specific panelists because of his or her expertise and experience. Each member of the panel will introduce himself or herself when answering a question as the first speaker. So let's start. The first question is to Professor Jing Tso Jiang. Professor Jiang, all through American history, different groups of Asians have been welcomed to the US at different times. For example, the Chinese were welcome when the Western part of the transcontinental railroad was being built. This was mentioned in the documentary. Yet there have also been periods during which specific Asian American groups have been discriminated against internment of Japanese being a dark example of this. For those who have immigrated to this country in the last 50 years or so, such negative incidents might appear to be a thing of the past. Yet, very recently, we have seen tensions between the US and China rise over a host of issues, such as balance of trade, intellectual property rights, and so on. A couple of months ago, Asian Americans from China and South Korea have been harassed over the coronavirus. Can you elaborate on this? Also, please do remember to introduce yourself at first. Sure, sure. Thank you, Professor Rahman, and uh, thank you, Dr. Huyan, and thank you, the, all the audience tonight. And so, uh, since I only have three minutes, I will just focus on uh, talk about the uh, coronavirus and also my personal experience. So first of all, I will introduce myself. So my name is Jing Zhejiang. So I'm uh, currently as an associate professor of economics from Edinburgh University. So actually uh, came to US in 2009 from China. Uh, I came to US to pursue my doctoral degree from Washington State University. So after I graduated from Washington State U University, I joined the Edinburgh University big family, become one of the professors there. And luckily I become part of the Erie community as well. And so, uh, as I said, uh, this documentary is very educational, but I will focus in my uh, talk related to the coronavirus. So when the coronavirus started to associate with uh, my home country, 
And uh, I actually got a little bit scared. So for two weeks, I didn't go outside, go shopping because I heard a bad story from my friend from the big cities. And they actually got a negative uh, reaction from people in you know, a grocery store. So that definitely scared me a little bit. So two weeks later, I went to the grocery store and I started to uh, go out with my family uh, to walk around after dinner. And uh, on it's totally opposite experience that my friend experienced. And so instead of getting any negative reaction from people in your community, I actually got a lot of smiles and people waving hand to me. And so I told my experience with my friend in the big city, they got surprised. But for me, I don't feel surprised because it's really the seven year experience in your community. I feel it's a, a very welcoming community. And uh, people here are always open hand, uh, open heart to welcoming. Um, welcoming me and especially during that special period I even have uh, non-Asian colleagues and they actually text me asked me are you okay I, we heard about national story about how people attacking the Asian American but Asian I said American. no I don't feel that and so it is um, uh, a blast to be able to be in this community so the reason I share this experience uh, that I have two reasons to share this experience so the first reason is because I feel uh, this is a great opportunity for Erie community because uh, I believe in my generation, we came to the United States because we are attracted by the inclusive environment here. And so I'm happy that uh, Erie really can are. preserve this community in this special period of time. And hopefully we can keep uh, developing and uh, get uh, better and better. And the second reason I want to point out is because uh, I was just thinking about, uh, although I don't experience the negative impact, it doesn't mean I shouldn't voice opinions and stand, stand by everybody who experienced negative impact because they're rich race or gender. The reason is because being human being, we should stand together to fighting for the equality for all the human beings. So I have a two years old, in, no, I have a two years old daughter and I had a dream. I, I was thinking the other day, I was thinking, I hope when she grow up, she doesn't need to worry about her skin color. She doesn't need to worry about her gender, etc. And the only thing need to, she needs to consider is how she can use his uh, capability to help to develop the civilization of the whole human beings. Uh, so uh, since I only have three minutes, if, uh, if we have actual time after the whole panel discussion, uh, all the panel address their questions, and I will be happy to talk more about international tree, which it will be uh, related to the economics. And thank you. Our next question is on the history of Asian Americans in Erie and Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Harjinder Saverwal has been a part of the Erie community for the past 50 years and is one of the first people from India to settle in this area. Mr. Saverwal, could you tell us how the immigrant community has grown in Erie since your arrival? Uh, we are not getting his audio. We are not getting his audio. Thought at that time, I started looking for some business and I bought a business with a Dr. Lopero here in business. We were partners for some time and then I purchased the business and worked, uh, worked uh, and worked and all the time to get, com uh, compensate for my living expenses. And uh, I uh, had uh, been uh, working to expand the business. I expanded it and I then I started looking for local uh, when i came i was one of the few indians there and uh, th there were uh, most of them they were in a stable job but they were moving out also so it was never more than 10 or 20 people at a time when i came then it started building up slowly as the, uh, the time went and they all uh, 
had a um, common question to know more people. So more and more people came slowly and we started making a gathering for a uh, time for uh, socializing and uh, people started me meeting each other once a week for uh, for common uh, uh, topics to discuss or to have a social hour uh, uh, once in the evening uh, every week and then it became india association for a bigger group of people and we used to hold meetings at Gannon or Mercyhurst for display of Indian movies. And that was the way we got together one another once a week, no, once a month, sorry. And uh, then we became more and more people came and we have a bigger uh, India association now. At that time, we were only 25 to 30 people for movie and all this stuff. And now that we have India Association, we have a very stable group of people and it's uh, there for, uh, for some functions that we hold nationally uh, for Republic Day celebration, for Diwali, for these are all uh, very important Indian festivals that people have to enjoy together. So we get together and then this thing went on, it's still going on. India Association is now around 150 or 200 people there when we gather on these uh, per social meetings. And uh, uh, after that, now I have been uh, getting in the process of uh, getting old and I retired and uh, uh, in this process I'm experiencing some of the personal problems, hearing and aging and weakness, body weakness and things like that. But I still am growing, they are doing regular exercises. I grow at, uh, uh, for uh, this thing, I do every day I uh, do morning evening exercises and maintaining a good health and doctors ask me that you are not 90, 89 you are 75 because I have a good physique and good fun I'm functioning very good so uh, now it's time for me to, I, to talk about my children I came here to raise my family so I took my my two sons, they went to Mercyhurst and they both played uh, tennis and they were number one players uh, for tennis, for uh, uh, City tennis. Rec, for Erie and they were the most popular, well-known players. And during this time, we used to have uh, guests from outside and we entertained the guests as our personal guests at my home. And the students who played there, they were very happy about it. And now it's uh, my, I have three grandkids, two sons, and they son, are daughters. both, uh, my granddaughters are settled in Pittsburgh and my grandson is in uh, Chicago. Chicago. And he is one of the best uh, uh, doctors. He graduated recently from uh, yes. Rush Hospital in Chicago. And he has joined a group of uh, five doctors together. And this is what I wanted to uh, complete my dream here. So I am very happy that we have this uh, time with this. Ten minutes, Do you need me to say any more about that? My dad was a first, he was the ambassador of Erie, Pennsylvania. 
anytime there was an Indian, an Indian doctor, anytime there was a, uh, an Indian coming over from the motherland, he would be the first one to go to. So I am real proud of that. And you just have to figure this out as the American dream. Thank you. Thank you. So that was a personal story from Mr. Saverwal. Uh, each of us has these interesting personal stories. So continuing on, uh, Professor Anjali Sehe will be the first speaker for the next question. Professor Sehe, US has built a fantastic system that attracts some of the best brains from all over the world, be it artists, physicians, scientists, or people with extraordinary ability in pretty much every field. Most of these immigrants got a free or highly subsidized education in the country of their origin. For example, people from Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan typically get free education till the 10th grade. In Singapore, primary level is free, secondary, tertiary, and university levels are highly subsidized. Is it fair? that those investments by countries of our origin are lost to them because we are now applying our expertise to build our new country. This is popularly known as brain drain. Professor Sehe, you have written a book on this issue. Could you elaborate, please? Yes, um, thank you, Professor Rahman. Hello, everyone. I would like to start with introducing myself a little bit. My name is Anjali Sahai, and I work as associate professor at Gannon University in the political science program in the School of Public Service and Global Affairs. Uh, I'm also serving on Governor Wolf's advisory commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. And a little bit of, about my background. I am a first generation Indian American who migrated to this country to pursue a degree in higher education about 20 years ago. So I can be actually considered as a direct product of this very topic of brain drain we are discussing, just like a lot of us um, that we know. So the migration of the best and brightest from developing countries is a growing concern. It's always been a growing concern because of the time and the money invested in the education, especially the primary education and training of the young professionals in the countries of origin. And this is a great loss and because of the resources lost once these people migrate with the direct benefit accruing to the recipient countries who have not forked out the cost of educating them. However, economic and educational migration is at the end of the day, a voluntary choice made by individuals which the countries of origin cannot control. Brain drain, by its very definition, is the departure of educated or professional people from one country, economic sector, or field for another, usually for better standards of living and quality of life, higher salaries, access to advanced technology, and more stable political conditions in the developed countries. I acknowledge that host country policies create the necessary conditions for brain drain to take place. In other words, the pull factors to fill in jobs in the sectors where they find talent is scarce in their own countries. But I would also argue that in the fairness part of the question you raised, that the sending countries may also benefit from the out migration of their best and the brightest workers and students. These benefits are usually over long term and they are measured as remittances, investments and savings associated with return migration and other social networkings that link expats to the countries of origin. There's a lot of examples about this, but one big example that stands out is that India is retained its position as the world's top recipient of remittances with its diaspora sending a whopping 79 billion US dollars in 2018. These are popularly known as dollars wrapped with care as the Liberato World Bank has talked about and they go a long way in helping families back home. And there are also various examples, personal stories about people that go back. Many professionals are returning to their home countries to six-figure salaries where 
with higher education and training that they received abroad, uh, you could almost argue that these developed countries, such as the United States, are now witnessing their own brain drain or a reverse brain drain in that sense, as there is a worldwide um, race to attract talent wherever it may be. So there is positive benefits of an out migration. And the lastly, you know, something that I have uh, talked about in my book, that the diaspora communities, which we will address later as a question as well, um, they are very successful and visible in their whole societies. Um, Asians tend to be termed as a model minority group. They are very visible, very wealthy, um, and this can go a long way in influencing economic and political benefits for their home countries. So I think brain gain and brain circulation strategies um, is an element of soft power for the home countries, usually developing countries, and they really need to harness this potential of their diaspora communities. I hope I have answered your question, but that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question uh, goes to Walter Ang. Uh, there is tremendous pressure on children of first generation Asian Americans to go to very prestigious institutions of higher learning and study subjects that lead to very secure employment. This includes professions such as physicians, engineers, researchers, and so on. Compared to their percentage of the entire population, there are three times as many physicians and almost four times as many engineers and scientists among Asian Americans. We have all heard the term tiger mom. However, uh, this puts enormous pressure on children, so much so that the level of burnout, including suicidal thoughts among college students, is quite high in this group. The last part of today's screening featured a highly successful comedian from India. So the question is, Shouldn't we encourage our children to go into areas where they have talent and interest rather than following money and prestige? To put it in a different way, as a community, are we losing a Picasso in order to get just a mediocre engineer? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Walter Ang. I am the author of Barangay to Broadway, Filipino American Theater History. I cover the Filipino American theater profession and industry for the news website inquirer.net. And uh, to answer the question that uh, Dr. Shafiq uh, posed, uh, yes, we, I think we absolutely should encourage uh, Asian American uh, children uh, and all Asian Americans to pursue careers outside of what we would consider the usual uh, professions or traditional professions. Um, the, in, the re in recent years, uh, the, the popularity of movies such as Crazy Rich Asians have sort of like opened up uh, possibilities uh, that people have not thought about. And it's, it's easier sometimes for parents to accept uh, alternative careers, especially in the arts, if they're able to see the possibilities, which is why visibility and representation are so important. Uh, but just to give examples, um, because uh, these are like the fields that I usually cover for uh, my journalism, uh, but like in, in publishing and in theater, uh, just to give examples for the from the Filipino American theater population, uh, we have like four Tony Award winners from the Philippine American population. We have Lea Salonga, who has a Tony Award for acting. We have Clint Ramos, who has a Tony Award for costume design. And um, if you are all familiar with the musical Avenue Q and the musical Frozen, which I, I think most parents are familiar with that musical, a Philippine American is the composer for, for those two musicals. His name is Robert Lopez. And uh, Lena Hall is an actress. She was in the musical uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. She has a Tony Award for acting in that musical as well. And uh, more recently, we have like Tony, uh, we have Philippine Americans who have been in Broadway musicals such as Be More Chill. Uh, the younger audience members would be familiar with that musical. But like, for example, uh, actresses have played Jasmine on, uh, in Aladdin. 
Um, Didi Magnohall has played Nessa Rose in Wicked. Uh, Ali Elwalt has played Christine Day in Phantom of the Opera. Uh, there is a recent uh, musical that has been popular on Broadway. The title is Hades Town. Uh, the female lead has been played by Eva Noblezada. Uh, and then I would like to switch over to like uh, publishing. Uh, there has been a recent uh, bumper crop of uh, young adult novels and middle grade novels that have been written by Philippine American uh, writers, uh, such as Melissa De La Cruz, Erin Entrada Kelly, Mavis Spicho, uh, Randy Ribay, and Malaka Gurib. Uh, there is also one um, uh, Desi Pinay. Uh, uh, author that I discovered. Uh, her name is Roshani Chokshi, and she wrote, she has written a young adult series called uh, the Star Touched Queen series and a middle grade series called the Arusha series. So uh, I just sort of wanted to point out, the reason why I gave so many examples is that I wanted the audience to realize that there are options and possibilities outside of what we would consider like traditional professional careers. Dr. Shafiq. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ms. Brittany Fisher. Um, Ms. Fisher, since you are the youngest person in this panel, the question to you is about young people. When we talk about dreamers, that is young undocumented immigrants who were brought to the US as children, we typically think of people from Latin America. As we saw in the screening, there are Asian Americans in that group as well. According to the Migration Policy Institute, fully 10% of the young people potentially eligible for DACA are Asians. I personally was very surprised to learn this statistic. Would you tell us a little bit about who these young people are and what could we do to help them? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, really quickly, just a quick introdu introduction of myself. Um, my name is Brittany Fisher and I'm a 26 year old Korean Japanese mechanical engineer. Um, I was born in Hawaii, but I grew up most of my life actually in the Northeastern part of Pennsylvania in a predominantly Caucasian uh, small town. I was lucky enough to be a to be born um, US citizen while my parents were also, um, they had uh, just acquired their US citizenship as well. Um, so I'm, I'm technically like second generation. Uh, to answer your question though, um, who are these dreamers are? They are, as you said, they are undocumented um, young immigrants that were brought over most uh, likely from their parents when they wanted to move to this country. Um, and they unfortunately just don't have their um, social security number or citizenship. Um, the DREAM Act, uh, many people know this name, but it was started a little bit before 9-11 um, where actually both the Republican and the Democratic Party were actually in favor of this act, which would help these children um, undocumented children to um, like a, to find their way uh, to attain citizenship. However, once when 9-11 started is when things kind of went downhill for the DREAM Act. And unfortunately, multiple revisions have been created and unfortunately have not been passed yet. Um, a way that, you, uh, that we can do to help get this DREAM Act past um, is I think the best way to actually is to normalize this situation. Yes, it is common, um, like mostly not in the Latin America community, but it has, as you said, there's a significant impact also in the Asian community as well. And I feel like culturally, a lot of Asian American Americans, what we tend to do is we tend to internalize our struggles. Um, in order to bring awareness and bring more support is we need to learn how to talk about it. It is uncomfortable, but it is an important issue um, for our younger generation, for their futures in this country. 
Um, so I think organizations uh, can definitely help with that because they connect people uh, to form support around these uh, situations. They can provide networking opportunities to help these young um, undocumented people to fight their way to get the DREAM Act passed. Um, so just even basically just talking with your friends, your family about this issue can really help bring awareness and support for this uh, for the DREAM Act to be passed. Um, and we can also learn a lot from civil rights movements in the past that have been done by African Americans. Uh, a lot of our privileges now have come from them actually from the past. So we, we can really learn a lot from them and other minorities that well are suffering through the same issue um, right now. So um, encourage, I encourage everyone that is, is watching this virtual panel to, you know, to donate to organizations that um, support this cause. There is actually, um, I just found this one website called unitedwedream.org that provides a lot of um, toolkits for different organizations like educator, educationers, institutions um, on how to help undocumented students. Um, there's also this toolkit that I found for creating sanctuaries in different cities. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to refer to this website because there's a lot of material there. Unfortunately, I haven't gone through them all, but I think that's a good stepping stone to at least uh, become aware, become educated, and you can find ways um, to support this movement. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next question goes to Mr. Nandu Sabedi. Uh, U.S. has traditionally accepted large number of refugees from all over the world. Not every city accepts refugees, but IRI does. IRI is a part of RRSC, namely Refugee Resettlement in Small Cities. Uh, you have been directly involved with this. So uh, please tell us about where these refugees are coming from, why are they coming, and how is IRI's resettlement program helping them? <clears throat> Uh, so thank you, Professor Rahman. Um, let me introduce myself first before I get into the question. Uh, my name is Nandu Subedi. I came directly to Iwi um, as a refugee from South Asia. It's a small country known as Bhutan, which is between India and China. Um, I came here as a refugee, but spent my 17 years of life in a refugee camp. Um, I came in 2008 um, and joined a resettlement team, the refugee resettlement team at Catholic Church in 2009 and started working with more new, new immigrants and refugees um, to get resettled in the town. Um, <clears throat> well, if we are talking about the current situation, there are probably a little over 70.9 million um, refugees in the world. Um, and among these, about 30 million are the minor, the below 18 of ages. Um, Italy has a history of accepting refugees from all over the world. There has been a trend for a group from different nationality at a different time. Department of State, in collaboration with USCIS and PRM, annually determine groups to begin to settle. And we are a part of that program and we pick a share what our city gets. If we look back in, in if we look back for 10 years from now, um, the majority came from South Asia, following um, it from Africa, Middle East, Europe, South America, and different part of the world. The majority of the refugee and immigrant come to Iri following their friend and family 
which is called the US Thai case in resettlement language. City has over 20% of population, as well as 13.4% um, of county's population consists the first generation of immigrant here. We also have worked with plenty of non-US Thai case, which is also called a free case, that who are randomly picked our city to be placed from the State Department. There are two resettlement agencies in Erie, Catholic Charities Counseling and Adoption Services, where I work currently, and USCRI Erie. Both agencies work with um, their own national agencies and communicate with them and get updated information about who is coming in Erie and when. Erie's resettlement program helps all refugees resettle here with the most basic needs like food, shelter, and clothing. We also work on their medical needs, enroll their kids in school, and even adults in ESL program, as well as we work with all, I mean, with the local employer in town for employment placement to those who are capable to go to work right away after they come to you. We have over 85% of self-sufficiency rate through employment program within their first six months in Erie. The refugee resettlement number for each year is determined by the President of the United States. After the 2016 election, the total national number are gradually decreasing. And that trend follows Erie's resettlement number either. Two agencies resettle more than 850 in number in 2016, which is decreased to less than 100 in 2019. So it's hardly we have had any people we had resettled in 2020. To that question, this is not fair. Um, refugees, I mean, there are been talking going on about illegal immigrants or the people crossing the borders and stuff like that. But refugees are the one who come into this country through a very rigorous vetting process. I came as a refugee and I can recall that I had to spend all 17 months interviewing with nine different panels in that 17th period month to get a visa to travel to the United States. So, I mean, the talk about illegal immigrants and completely stopping the legal immigrants to get into this country is, to my understanding, is not an American culture. So I will stop here now talking about refugees. Um, and then um, at last, if there is any questions that um, I can answer, I'll resume my talk. Thank you. Our next question is to uh, Nikan Astari Carpenter. Uh, Nikan, you work in the mayor's office. Now, according to the Center for American Progress, a nonprofit public policy research and advocacy organization, Asian Americans will constitute nearly 10% of eligible voters by 2036. However, in 2016, while more than 64% of white Americans turned out to vote, it was only just 49% among the Asian Americans. This more than 10% point gap has existed for decades, 
and it shows no sign of closing. So my question to you is, what kind of initiatives do you have from your office to help immigrants and refugees to become citizens, to encourage voter registration among them, and to make sure that they accurately complete this census taking place this year so that their numbers are counted correctly? Thank you so much for the question, Dr. Rahman Salam. Uh, my name is Niken Astari Carpenter. Uh, I'm a first generation immigrant, came from Indonesia. Uh, when I am in Indonesia, I served as a judge um, before I migrated here to follow my husband. Uh, I work at the mayor's office, as Dr. Rahman said, that um, I work as a new American liaison for the city of Erie. I also serve at the Pennsylvania Governor's Commission on Asian Pacific and American Affairs. So uh, first of all, just to be clear that the city does not have a program to help refugees and immigrants to become citizens. But there are organizations like MCRC, uh, Multicultural Community Resource Center, they have a citizenship preparation class. Or if people would like to study independently, they can check out citizenship materials from the Erie County Public Library. The, the library has a uh, various collection on citizenship, uh, either books, CDs, DVDs, and flashcard. Now, the city of Erie do partner with US Federal Courthouse, who then coordinates with USCIS Buffalo Office, US Attorney Office, and International Institute to host citizenship ceremony uh, at the US Federal Courthouse. Uh, typically, we have this like 10 ceremonies per year. The, the city social media then stream the ceremony through Facebook Live. And uh, during this citizenship ceremony, we invite uh, several members of the community to give welcoming speech. And since uh, taking the office, uh, our mayor, Mayor Chamber, has uh, been giving, attending the citizenship ceremony and giving welcoming speech. And it has been the highlight of uh, He's, he's always looking forward to this. It, he said that it's always his highlight of the month. Um, beside the judges and the mayor, of course, um, there are other guest speakers. And one of them is the representative of League of Women Voters of Erie. Um, they always come and speak about the importance of voting. And they also hand out a, a voter registration form to the new newly sworn US citizen. They, they even stay after the ceremony and help this new citizen to fill out the, uh, the form. And for the past a few years to my recollection in Erie, we, um, as, as I said, we typically have 10 ceremonies and in each this, of the ceremonies, we naturalize about 50 uh, citizen. And that give us like about 500 newly sworn US citizen per year. And uh, since I, my position is a new position in Erie. Uh, when I first uh, started working in the mayor's office, people asked me, how many actually refugee and immigrant in Erie? And the city doesn't have the data. So I started to work and collecting data, uh, working with the US federal courthouse. I found out that between June 2013 to February 2020, we have more than 2,500 newly sworn US citizens that came from 94 different countries. I mean, imagine in Erie, 94 different countries. And I'm, I'm very excited that we are having the census right now. And, and the county and the city are working together to make the census successful. And uh, I've been encouraging everyone I know, uh, regardless their age and immigration status to fill out the census because Erie County could lose up to 1.06 billion in federal funding that could support our school, roads, neighborhoods, community center, uh, healthcare, housing, public safety, and parks for the next 10 years. And I, I, I do understand that there is also some concern in the, uh, you know, among refugee and immigrants that, uh, about their personal information, right? Um, but I can assure you that by law, our personal information cannot be shared with any individual or agency for the next 72 years. And uh, if you haven't done it, so please fill out the census. You can do it online by go to my2020census.gov or you can call uh, via phone at 844-330-2020.
Now, if you don't speak English, don't worry, because the US Census Bureau, they provide translated web page and guides in 59 non-English languages. These include American Sign Languages, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, American Sign Language, and as well as guide in Braille and also large print. Um, the deadline to submit this census has been extended to October 31st. So please fill it up if you haven't done it. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Thank you. Uh, we now come to what is probably the most important question of today's discussion. There is considerable bias in the Asian American community as regards skin color, lending vocal support to this movement. Given the deadly violence perpetrated on Mr. Vincent Chin, the young Chinese man that we saw in the documentary. Shouldn't we organically identify ourselves with Black Lives Matter? Isn't it time that we look into our souls, acknowledge the bias and educate ourselves to overcome it? So here is the question to the entire panel. Please elaborate on the issue of bias in the Asian American community towards African Americans and Latinos, and also tell us how this culture of bias can be changed. This is open to the entire panel. Um, a lot of the legislation on equal rights were born out of the movements in the 1960s for the civil rights movements. So I think sometimes um, people of color tend to forget that the, the liberties and the, the benefits that we enjoy today uh, are sort of like indirectly a result of the, the efforts that were made by African Americans, by Black Americans. So uh, it behooves people of color to support uh, Black Americans um, in, in that regard. But I'm, I'm referring more to the Asian Americans supporting the movement by the Black population. Um, I may want to jump in here a little bit and just elaborate. I feel uh, the Asian American community um, overall tends to be a silent community. They don't like to be in the forefront of political movements. And this is uh, something that we see time and again, post 9-11, um, currently all the movements and protests that are going on. Um, they're kind of caught between two races, if I may say that. Uh, they really don't know how to react to something like that. And like, like Walter said, definitely, you know, Asians and other groups benefited from all the civil rights movements and all the benefits that we got with respect to equal rights, equal pay. Um, a lot of these came to the different communities. Um, however, um, they just, I think I want to start with Asians are so diverse. Uh, I just want to start with that. Asia itself is so diverse. Uh, you have East Asia, you have Southeast Asia, you have South Asia, you have Central Asia. Um, so Asia it, in itself is not a cohesive group. And so when we talk about, you know, the Hispanic Americans, they're not cohesive either, but the disparity in the Asian community is so high and so large that they really don't come together as one big Asian uh, group. And so unless it's something that hits them directly, I feel like they like to remain like a silent community. And the uh, Protest after Vincent Chin's murder, I think that was one of the biggest Asians protesting that we have seen in this country. Dr. Rahman, I would like to add uh, to the discussion about that. I think as somebody that's new coming to uh, this country, I feel like I don't know much about the history of uh, America. I don't know much about the history of slavery. Uh, and I think when uh, we, our Asian American community start to learn about 
uh, what happened, you know, the, the hundred years of slavery, they, they will understand, uh, you know, I, this is what I said to my friend, I, I don't understand what the, uh, your community, the, the, the black and Latino people community going through, but you know what, I am here for you. You know, we, we can show support because um, we, uh, just like uh, Walter said that this uh, uh, civil rights movement, right? Uh, the, 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 the history of 400 years of racial discrimination against black people was actually the birth of other racial discrimination against Asian uh, community, against Latino community, uh, Islamophobia and so forth. So um, if we can put ourselves in, you know, What's, what's the term in, in America? Uh, put yourself in their shoes, then you will understand. And, and we might not understand, but we can show some support. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes left. So I'd like at this point to go over to a viewer question. Uh, this question, um, Let's see, I'm, I'm looking through these questions. Uh, okay. Uh, one person has asked about DACA. How can a teenager like me help support and raise awareness about an issue like this? So this is open to the entire panel. Um. If it's all right with you, I guess I'll go first since uh, I have I touched a little bit about this before my uh, response earlier. Um, good for you, whoever uh, as, asked that question. You're very brave to, um, you know, put yourself out there. And I'm very, very proud of you uh, for thinking about this issue at such a young age and, you know, I commend you so much for your bravery. I, I would say that probably the best that you can do is to keep raising your voice like you have done now. Keep raising your voice to your parents about this issue, your friends in your school, um, you know, other classmates, uh, your teachers even. Like I mentioned before, there is a website um, called unitedwedream.org that does provide toolkits on how we can support the undocumented students in, um, in our country. Um, like I'm, I'm looking at it right now, like toolkit for educators and institutions. Uh, this can definitely help their institutions raise, aware, like raise resources and support systems available for these undocumented students. Um, and uh, I'll be honest, social media is not my bestest friend, but if I know that right now is, it does play a major role, especially with during this Black Lives Matter movement, using social media as a platform to raise awareness and spread amongst everyone, not just locally in your, you know, in your close friend group, but globally as well, um, to try and normalize situation, bring awareness to situation. Uh, eventually you will get support. There's, there's a lot of young um, inspirational people like you uh, who was it? Like Greta Thornburg, I believe, as one example, who raised awareness. I, I know it's a different situ situation, but there are plenty of more young, um, brave people like you who want to help with this issue. And I'm sure you can look to those people as inspiration for how to raise your voice and bring awareness to this uh, problem. So thank you again for asking that question. And I wish you all the best. Can I do a follow up on that? Just a very quick follow up. I want to plug in my political science here. Uh, all the teenagers today will be ready to vote in four years or five years. And I just want to tell them that, you know, the first step towards taking part in any process is voting. So please make sure that you're being making yourself aware about different issues and voting correctly and using your vote. Because America has an average of, I believe, 55% voting rate, voter turnout rate is so low. So definitely you as a teenager can raise awareness amongst your friends and yourself and make sure that you vote. I think that's the first step. 
Absolutely. Dr. Rahman, do we still have time? Can I jump into this? You question? can jump in very briefly because we have to finish pretty quickly now. Okay, so, um, you know, as uh, Brittany said that raising awareness that you have to educate yourself first. Uh, Brittany mentioned about the Center for American Progress, National Immigration Law Center and United We Dream. They found that 25.7% of DACA recipients have a child right now who is a US citizen. If, um, if you like elaborate all the total population of DACA recipient, at least we have 200,000 US citizen children live in the US currently who have a DACA recipient for a parent. And if you add a spouse on that, the number is well over 1.5 million. And most of these DACA member maybe live in the shadow because they have a deep ties to our community, but, but you know, because they don't want their uh, status to be known and uh, before COVID-19 lockdowns, they were fully employed and some of them lo lost their job, uh, but they didn't get the federal help because the law did not allow them to get the federal help. Uh, they don't get the stimulus check, for example. Um, many of these uh, uh, DACA recipients, they speak English as the primary language because uh, they, um, I, I think they were like about six years old when they arrived in the United States. And uh, most of them are educated in American schools and have gone to college and uh, become a native born uh, and, and have a higher uh, college degree than uh, native born Americans. And this uh, generation are called the dreamer, right? And, and this dreamer cannot apply by law for immigration status. Um, so uh, um, the current DACA program that we're having now was created by President Obama in 2012 as an extension of a program uh, from previous president to maintain family solidarity. But the support of an Asian, uh, of, of an American president uh, disappeared in September 2017 when former US uh, Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions uh, announced that President Trump was ending the DACA program on ground that President Obama's creation of DACA was an unconstitutional use of excessive authority. Uh, but shortly afterward, Trump announced that he would de delay the deportation until after US Supreme, Supreme Court upheld his judgment of uh, unconstitutionality. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to find the word. But in, in the late fall of 2019, the court uh, hearings on DACA and, and will probably announce their decision sometimes uh, this summer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I don't, Ironically, uh, the court is probably of the view that DACA can be created by executive authority, but can also be ended by the same authority. In, 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 in other words, that President Trump will be wrong about the unconstitutionality uh, of presidential authority to create such program, but the right, but, but he's correct about the constitutionality of his ending it. In that case, if, if in that case, if that happened, the fate of over 800,000 DACA recipients um, and, and which 31, more than 31,000 of them working in a healthcare and uh, area, it's, it's going to be tragic breakup of their families and um, in the hand of our current president. So hopefully it won't happen. Uh, then we uh, will move on to another viewer question. Um, this is a very generic question, and it is what part of the film resonated with you the most? So we can have one or two persons talking about this. Yeah, Dr. Sahib, do you want to tackle that? Um, sure, I think uh, various things resonated with me the most. Uh, I mean, a lot, but one of the things that was, um, I really thought that being from the academic side, uh, things that I did not know before, I think those are the things that really I liked, um, the movement towards multiculturalism in the academic, um, in the academia, uh, to include more of these studies and more of these programs. I think that was really interesting for me. Uh, various things resonated, but I think this is something I did not know. 
And also, I did not know so much about the Korean American struggles, the part that they showed in LA and the interracial tensions that tends to happen between different minority groups. And I thought I was really educated after watching those parts in the documentary. Would someone else like to, yeah. I don't want to be greedy, but I want to answer this question. You know, I, I, I wrote it earlier that I am so inspired by Patsy Ming because, you know, when the woman said that Patsy Ming is a short woman and easy to be dismissed, but she won't let anyone to dismiss her. I am, I'm five foot tall and I, I have to see her. I want to be like her. Thank you. Uh, we will then close uh, our panel discussion for today. I uh, just want to briefly mention one point. Uh, that is, if we take home a single piece of wisdom from today's discussion, it is really the following. The rights and the opportunities we enjoy as immigrant communities today have not always been etched in stone. The civil rights struggle of the 60s succeeded because other minority groups such as the Jews work together with Blacks. As immigrants, our rights and privileges will rise or fall together with those of other minority groups. As such, we must educate ourselves about that history. Teach that history to our children and the newcomers and join hands with other minority groups. One positive thing about Americans is their can-do attitude. Americans are known as problem solvers. So hopefully, members of the Asian American community will join with the protesters to solve one of the biggest problems that has faced this country ever since its beginning, namely racial injustice. I hope that today's discussion will inspire each viewer to work towards that goal. This brings us to the end of today's panel discussion. Uh, thank you viewers for remaining engaged with us despite the separation in space. Uh, please understand that because of time issues, we have not been able to answer the many questions that the viewers posed. Thank you members of the panel for the wisdom that you provided to enlighten us today and special thanks to Hale uh, Kostensek and Tyler Novosilski of the local TV station WQLN for the technical help to make this event possible. Good night.